Predators from Space with Paul de Gelder. Welcome back to the Cosmic Companion. I'm James Maynard. Now yeah, this week we're going to imagine Predators from Space. As we welcome Shark Week regular Paul de Gelder to the show. Cool, huh? We're going to be talking about his new book, Shark. Why we need to save the world's most misunderstood predator. And did I mention, Rock's also going to be talking about predators from space. Uh, life on other worlds is likely to be far different than life on Earth. Greetings from the planet Argyle. All your missing socks are with us. However, most of the life forms throughout the cosmos are likely to share a few common traits. Not me. I'm punk mate. The laws of chemistry and physics suggest that carbon is an ideal chemical backbone for the formation of life. And water is a perfect medium if you want to create a bunch of complex chemicals and spread them around the planet. Because why wouldn't you want to do that if you had the chance, right? <laughs> so, also, many life forms on Earth depend on other life for their sustenance and survival. Even herbivores and vegans consume other forms of life. I mean, it can't be all be plants living off photosynthesis all snooty and stuff, you know. Mm. This means that life on other worlds is likely to include predators from space. Every living being requires a food source, whether that be sunlight or jackfruit tacos. Yum, tacos? Mm, I agree. If you thought the Earth was a dangerous place, just imagine what kind of predators might be lurking out there in the rest of the universe. Now, the earliest known animal predator was an ancestor of the modern jellyfish, which plied Earth's oceans roughly 600 million years ago. Similar hunters may be found on other worlds where oceans are located. As a big universe around us, and astronomers currently know of around 5,200 planets orbiting other stars. I rule that's a lot of planets. And like the worlds in our own solar system, a fraction of these planets elsewhere can are rocky with varying amounts of water on their surface or in their atmosphere. Uh, these fluids are ideal for flying, floating, or swimming. So, let's take a look at water worlds. Although some life forms, I'm looking in your direction, sponges, derp, 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 derp. are immobile, living out their lives on the same boring rock on which they were born, this may not be the best strategy for life if you're going to be a Predator from space! Now, if you're going to move around an ocean of liquid water, you either need to float or propel yourself. Screw you, hippie. I'm staying right here. Let's face facts. Floating is probably not the most efficient way to hunt anything that moves. Tracking prey requires both a means of propulsion as well as control. The dude's right. I'm not lying. Yeah, <laughs> right. Thank you. Now, one of the most successful of all marine predators on Earth are sharks, and they've been around for about 420 million years. And we'll be here long after you're gone. These creatures streamline to get through water, uh, fins for propulsion and steering, and just designed for hunting. Maybe a motto for marine predators on other worlds. That's right. We're talking space Now, this idea, of course, brings us to our special guest, Paul de Gelder, talking about his experience being attacked by one of these creatures. A space shark. Uh, an, an, an earthbound shark, not a space shark. And later devoting his career to preserving what he calls the world's most misunderstood predator. Looking deep into the universe, we see backwards in time. And the oldest light in the universe 
holds secrets to how everything around us will, one day, end. Meanwhile, stars, planets, and galaxies dance in an intricate ballet, occasionally giving birth to life. We are a fledgling species, just beginning to visit other worlds. We are a way for the universe to understand itself. The Cosmic Companion strives to bring the universe down to Earth, and we depend on your help to make it happen. For information on subscriptions and ways to donate to this program, please visit thecosmiccompanion.net. Thank you. This week on The Cosmic Companion, we're happy to be joined by Paul de Gelder. He is a shark attack survivor who has turned into a tireless advocate for preserving these magnificent creatures. You've probably seen them on the Discovery Channel or on Netflix. And his new book, Shark! Uh, is coming out 17th of January. Welcome to the show, Paul. Uh, thanks for having me, mate. Yeah. Yeah, so can you tell us, uh, give us a brief intro to you know who you are and how you became such an advocate for sharks? Uh, sure. Yeah, I'm from Australia. I joined the Australian Army Paratroopers in November 2000 and uh, did that for five years, had a really amazing time, and then switched over and did selection for what's called the Navy Clearance Divers, which is a force that does underwater bomb disposal, land-based bomb disposal, uh, tactical missions, and underwater tools. And I switched over in 2005, and then one day in 2009, I went to work to do a counterterrorism exercise and I was in the water in Sydney Harbour alongside the Navy base and a 10 foot bull shark decided it was going to eat me for breakfast before I'd even had breakfast, which I think is quite rude and uh, <laughs> tried to kill me. And so fortunately it didn't succeed, but it did remove my entire hamstring and my, my hand as well. And I ended up losing most of my right leg, but you know, a uh, tough day at work. Managed to get back to the safety boat. My teammates kept me alive, went into a emergency surgery, and the road to rehab and recovery was uh, set and paying. Wow. And yet so many people would have become either angry at, speed, at sharks in general, uh, or at the very least, avoided the water at all costs. <laughs> yeah, I'm not <laughs> yeah, that smart. Did just the opposite. What? What, what, yeah, I'm a bit of a dummy, <laughs> to be honest. Uh, <laughs> uh, once bitten, twice guy, not so much. But uh, look, I, I really wasn't that interested in sharks to begin with. I was actually terrified of sharks. There were two things that I was deathly afraid of, sharks and public speaking. Mm -hmm. And now I'm a shark diving public speaker. So that's <laughs> a, an interesting world if you are uh, open to the possibilities of the universe. But uh I just wanted to go back to work. I just wanted to prove myself to the Navy that I could do the job. And I spent seven months doing that and then did go back to work. But uh, as an instructor as well, not, not as an operational diver, but I discovered that I really don't like teaching. And uh, so I was looking for other avenues of career path. There's you know, not much in the realm for a one-handed, one-legged bomb disposal diver in the civilian world. Uh, you know, they're not going to let me play with bombs anymore. I don't look like I'm that great at it. And <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. It doesn't look great on the resume. <laughs> no. Uh, so I was just open to anything that came along, and I, I moved into speaking a little bit. And then 60 Minutes came and wanted to do a couple of shows about my shark attack and my recovery. And you know, every time there was a, a shark incident in Australia, the media would come to me for a comment because my recovery and my attack was so hugely publicized around the country they thought what better person but i didn't actually know anything about sharks and so at, at the risk of looking like a dummy on television i started to read about sharks google them learn as much as i could so i could give an educated opinion and through doing that you know there's this old mantra knowledge dispels fear and so the more i learned about the plight of sharks the more i realized how little we had to fear of them and how much they have to fear from us. 
So that kind of was a nice military transfer because my military service was about standing up for people that can't stand up for themselves. And now I'm a voice for these animals that don't have a voice. And so I, I really take great purpose and reward in being able to do that for them. That is that's so, so interesting. Now, what is it about sharks? I mean, sharks predate the dinosaurs by quite a bit. <laughs> uh, yeah, they predate that, trees. Yeah, so what is it that makes them so successful? I mean, as species and as... 400, 450 million years of evolution remaining, you know, remaining mainly unchanged. They've just gotten a little smaller than the old school megalodon. Uh, not really enough food sources for the megalodon anymore. So they're just the the perfect predator of the ocean. And they're so, uh, they're just, they're so badly publicized. Once you've been in the water with them and you've seen them up close and you've seen how beautiful they are and how just peaceful in their own existence, the perfect part of their environment, they keep the balance of fish stocks safe and at levels that are manageable for the rest of the ecosystem. They just have this purpose-filled life and they perform it perfectly well. And then along comes humans and we try and screw it all up. So just I, I really enjoy my time in the water with them, this animal that everyone is so petrified of. You know, I know people that won't even stick their toes in the ocean because they're scared a shark is going to jump out of it like a sharknado and rip their limbs off. But it's just, it's so not true. All right, all right. Um, well, piranha-sized sharks, I suppose, could <laughs> still be out there somewhere. Uh, so what is it that terrifies us so much about sharks if, when, it's, when we're more dangerous to them than they are to us? I think it's a few different factors. One of it is the unknown. Uh, un unknowing if they're there waiting for you, like the media says, lurking in the ocean, waiting to snatch your babies. <laughs> and the other one is, you know, take it from someone who's experienced it, getting eaten alive is not fun. And so I think it's a part of a survival instinct. It's not our natural environment. And so we're kind of like a fish out of water, but reversed. But that's their home. That's where they live. That's where they belong. That's where they do their work. If the day that a shark comes and knocks on my door and starts trying to gnaw my limbs off, that'll be the day that I have a problem with them. Yeah, yeah I've never quite understood the term shark infested water. Yeah, exactly. If there's a problem, it's because it's human infested water. Exactly right. <laughs> and so, you know, as you imagine, let's say life on other worlds, we're probably there. We'll probably there's probably likely to be other predators out there. Absolutely. There was yeah. thoughts that maybe octopus came from different planets and was seeded here by asteroids. So they're weird and wonderful creatures, sharks and octopuses. And that's one of the things I love about working for Shark Week and Discovery Channel and entering the ocean. It's almost like going to space. You know, you've got this suit on that you have to wear. You have to have a self-contained underwater breathing apparatus. And then you enter this you know, different dimension that is filled with aliens. And most people will never get to experience it. Most people will never see it dark with their real own eyes. And so that's what I love about doing the shows, writing this dark book, is that I get to take them on this journey to meet this animal that they might never get to see. And, you know, just because you might never get to see it, I grew up fascinated with dinosaurs and I used to read all about them and I draw pictures of them, but I'm never going to see a dinosaur. That doesn't mean we can't get excited about sharks and all the other ocean life. Well, you know, I mean, the extinction is going to be a thing in a few years, so. <laughs> Hopefully more than a few. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully never. Hopefully never. But, you know, you know, we're pushing the boundaries on what we can extract from our planet, which is really sad. You know, I had to I couldn't even bring myself to eat fish anymore. I stopped eating all animals on the planet because I didn't want to contribute to the destruction of the things that I love. Right, right. That's that's great. And you know, um we've been actually my wife and I are, you know, lifelong vegetarians and Oh, well done. And uh, you know, mainly for the, you know, because of the animal welfare yep. issues and we've installed um 
we've installed enough solar cells in our house so that we produce enough clean energy to completely offset that's amazing anything we use in fossil fuels so. yeah, good for you yeah that's the goal that's a bit of goal for everyone being self-contained off the grid not relying on fossil fuels and animal agriculture and all that garbage I mean, we live in a good-sized city, Tucson, so, you know, we're nowhere near yeah. off the grid. We have high-speed internet <laughs> meet for doing the shows yeah. and stuff. But, but, there's, but I, I love that you have a consciousness of, of your impact and general human impact on the natural world. Yeah, well, I went to Africa and I was shooting a documentary out there learning to hunt the uh, poachers. And my friend Damien Manda that runs the International Anti-Poaching Foundation uh, he was vegan out there and he's a huge man. He's a legend in my world in the Navy back in Australia. And he was vegan in the middle of Zimbabwe. And so I just thought to myself, well, if he can do it here, there's no reason I can't do it in Sydney. And plus, I didn't want to be a hypocrite. I, I'm trying to save the oceans. I'm trying to save sharks. At the same time, I'm contributing to the destruction of them. And so I, I like to be a lead by example sort of person. And so I thought, okay, well, if I'm going to justifiably stand up for the oceans, the sharks, the planet, then I need to be doing as much as I can to make a difference and lead by example as well. So that's what I started doing about five years ago. And I wouldn't t turn back. I love it. I love having that. Uh, it makes me feel good in my soul. Hmm. Hmm. And speaking of caring for the environment, sharks are often known simply for being predators, you know, terrorizing the occasional seaside village that <laughs> then re-elects its mayor for some strange reason. <laughs> um, but what do sharks do for the ecosystem that people may not know about thinking about just shark attacks and such? Well, one of the ways I like to describe it is by using examples. And so you might hear that sharks keep the ecosystem safe. They keep fish stocks in check. So what that means is, uh, for example, in far northern Queensland of Australia, uh, they were having a problem with the tiger sharks. And so they started killing off all the tiger sharks. The problem with that was the tiger sharks eat the sea turtles. There was no sharks to eat the sea turtles. The population exploded. The sea turtles ate all of the grass which starved the, what we call dugongs. You would know them as manatees. And so the manatee population dropped to almost extinct because they killed the sharks. And so what it does, you know, if you remove sharks from the top keystone species, then the populations of fish that they eat underneath them explode. They decimate populations below them. And then, you know, the herbivorous fish that eat the algae off the reefs, there's none of them left. So the algae explodes and suffocates the reefs and then you've got no reefs which are the lifeblood of the ocean homes for all the fish so you're basically collapsing this whole ecosystem by removing one animal at the top just incredible how those chain of dominoes can fall isn't it just and eventually it so ripples easy. down onto us yes yes not that that's the only reason for doing it but we're not <laughs> yeah. making those mistakes but um, and so now for people who are listening to this show, wondering what they can do if, to help protect sharks, if let's say they're not quite ready to jump off a boat just yet. <laughs> <laughs> how, how, how can people, how can people help protect these animals? Well, I would love it if everyone just stopped consuming the ocean, uh, as if it's just a, a market, we can just keep, keep taking and taking and taking and taking. But if you are going to eat seafood, make sure that you follow the Good Fish Guide. They have lists of species that are sustainable, as they say. I don't really believe in that word anymore. Uh, what you can also do is sign the petition. Join groups like um, Sea Shepherd, Shark Allies. They follow uh, social media posts by people that are doing uh, beachside a protest. Yeah, go, go down to the protest, meet some like-minded people, find out how you can help more through that, but sign the petitions. They do actually do a lot of good if everyone comes together and signs them. Uh, they take that to legislation. People like Dark Allies, they try and get the legislation changed so that the stocks of fish aren't being decimated by regulated and unregulated fishing vessels, uh, of which there is a lot you know the the main thing that is destroying our ocean is fishing 
And so if you can take as least part of that industry, then you're helping. And if more people do that, then it makes the hugest difference. That's, that's fabulous. And finally, uh, it's a sort of a two-part question, but what's next for you and where can people learn more about what it is that you're doing? Uh, you can always follow me on social media. I'm most active on Instagram because I like sharing the amazing photos that I get to take. I'm going to continue on with Shark Week. I've got three more shows to shoot before July, so I'm excited about that. Next trip's out to the Bahamas. You go and see the hammerheads and the tiger shark. And uh, I've taken up snowboarding, and I uh, discovered that you know I've, it's a natural progression. I've done a bunch of other stuff. I've got my parachute license now. I'm scuba diving. I'm free diving. And I've just discovered snowboarding, and I've discovered that the Australian Paralympic team doesn't have anyone in my category of amputation. And so if I get good enough in the next couple of years, you never know, you might see me on the Paralympic stage. That's great. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Paul. It was fabulous talking with you. My pleasure, mate. Thanks for having me. And that was Paul DeGelder, author of Shark, Why We Need to Save the World's Most Misunderstood Predator. Pick it up wherever you get your awesome shark books. Now, insects have been around for nearly as long as sharks. Uh, some worlds out there could even be home to giant venomous insects lurking in the shadows, waiting to pounce on unsuspecting prey. I can't even get me started on the space dragons. Space dragons. Really? I mean, these guys could be like the T-Rex of the T-Rexes of the galaxy, with poisonous breath and a wingspan that could block out the sky. Okay, probably not. Probably not. But it's not just the big, flashy creatures you're going to have to worry about. There are even more likely plenty of microscopic predators out there as well. <laughs> We're talking about space viruses and bacteria-like things that might possibly turn your insides into goo in no time flat. Gross. So, if you're planning on doing any space travel, make sure you pack plenty of bug spray and a good spacesuit. Trust me, you do not want to end up as dinner for one of these extraterrestrial beasties. If you enjoyed this episode of The Cosmic Companion, please subscribe, download, share, and do all that needle social media stuff that you do. I mean, it should be appreciated. I have invited 4,668,212 people already to like The Cosmic Companion. 213. And uh, while you're at it, head on over to thecosmiccompanion.net and check out all of our episodes and sign up for our newsletter. You can even wander around our new interactive 3D moon base and more. So, totes worth it. Next week on The Cosmic Companion, we're going to be talking about teaching kids about space. We're going to be joined by Dean Rigas. He is an astronomer at Cincinnati Observatory, and his new book, 1,000 Facts About Space, just came out from National Geographic Kids. Make sure to join us starting on the 21st of January. Clear skies.